Hi everybody, this is Dimitris Keridis, the founding director of the Navarino Network, a professor of politics and a member of parliament now. And I will be your host for uh, this evening once more uh, for our fourth session of our ninth uh, international symposium in uh, uh, world affairs, the Thessaloniki Symposium. It is an uh, event that started uh, eight years ago back in uh, 2012 on the occasion of the centenary of uh, the liberation of Thessaloniki, the city of Thessaloniki, organized by the Cultural Society of uh, Entrepreneurs of Northern Greece, headed by Stavros Andreadis, under the auspices of the city of Thessaloniki and its mayor, now Konstantinos Zervas, and with the support of the Navarino Network and the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, the Athens and Nicosia office. Henry Bonner, the director of the Adenauer Foundation here in Greece, uh, greeted us and saluted us uh, at the first uh, uh, session some uh, four weeks ago. I would also like to thank all our sponsors, including the American College of Thessaloniki, uh, Affix's uh, uh, organization, uh, our media sponsors, uh, TV and FM Kato, the local municipal media of Thessaloniki, and Kathimerini, the Athens uh, uh, Daily. Um, we are delighted with our panel uh, tonight. Um, I will say a few words about our two guests. Uh, let me tell you that this is our fourth session. We have already been meeting every Monday since the end of November, November 30th on uh, various topics, politics, economy, uh, Turkey. And today we will be dealing with uh, an issue of uh, great importance of which uh, most of us uh, know something, uh, but not really, uh, me in particular, uh, which has to do with uh, technology, uh, technological innovations, artificial intelligence, and the fourth industrial a revolution. We try to bring in uh, our symposium topics of uh, great importance that will uh, move and shape our lives uh, in the future. And in that regard, it is very timely, uh, this uh, session uh, today. We are being watched uh, through our Facebook pages, uh, Thessaloniki Symposium, Navarino Network, Cultural Society, Adenauer Foundation, our sites uh, in Greece and abroad. On average, we have some six, seven, eight thousand viewers, and uh, everything is being recorded and uh, uh, is posted for eternity through the help of the Bodosakis uh, Foundation media platform, Blood. Now, as I said before, I'm delighted to welcome uh, two uh, Greek stars of uh, the diaspora, uh, Michael Blesas and Konstantinos Daskalakis. Both are uh, quite known in the Greek public. Uh, they have been in the media and in the public uh, uh, view <clears throat> uh, a lot. Konstantinos, uh, 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 despite his young age, um, they have uh, kind of uh, fit perfectly the stereotype of the successful uh, Greek uh, emigre uh, abroad both in Boston at the famous uh, MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, uh, the great uh, um, American uh, university. Michael is a research scientist and the director of computing at MIT's uh, Media Lab, where he has been working since 1996. Uh, we knew each other from our time during the Clinton years back in the 90s. Uh, he stayed there to continue uh, he's uh, um, uh, continue excelling. I returned to uh, Greece. He was a member of the core technical and design team for the One Laptop Per Child initiative. Um, his current research interests include network security, wireless networks, automating fake news detection. I don't understand much of that. Everything is posted. You can find it on the internet. Uh, we have a very nice brochure made of the bios in the agenda, you can consult. And Konstantinos Daskalaki is our uh, second uh, guest and speaker. is a professor of computer science and electrical engineering at MIT. He holds a diploma in electrical and computer engineering 
from Metovio here in Athens and a PhD in electrical engineering and computer sciences from UC Berkeley. He has worked on computation theory, game theory, economics, probability theory, machine learning. He has published extensively. He has obtained computationally and statistically efficient methods for statistical hypothesis, et cetera, et cetera, a very long and rich uh, bio. Uh, Michael and Konstantinos, welcome to our uh, company, to our symposium. I really wish that next year or in some years to come, we will be able to welcome you in Thessaloniki, our beautiful city uh, in the north, to have you live. We usually have uh, six, 700 people in the room in Olympion uh, Theater, the central theater of Thessaloniki. This year, of course, because of the pandemic, we have to do it uh, um, online, uh, but uh, with some great success. And technology has provided us with the means to have this transatlantic uh, 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 dialogue, uh, which is very important. You will have a few minutes in the beginning for an opening statement, and then we will uh, turn into our discussion with me posing some um, uh, good and maybe not so good questions uh, as we move on for our time uh, until quarter to 10, 75 minutes sharp. Michali, let me start uh, with you as, um, as uh, <laughs> you are the senior. <laughs> thank you for reminding me that. Uh, and thank you very much for the invite. Uh, being a graduate of the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, I always welcome uh, the opportunity to come back uh, to the city where I have where I started my career and from where I got lots of experiences, very pleasant experiences. I always enjoy the opportunity coming back, even virtually as uh, today. Uh, our theme is a little bit general. We would like to focus a little bit. I thought we we're going to focus a little bit uh, more on artificial intelligence, which is one of the main components of what we call the fourth industrial re revolution. Uh, not as much a revolution as uh, a collection of a variety of technologies, enabling technologies that uh, in strength of, by means of their combination are accelerating uh, developments in society, in technology, in economy, everywhere. Uh, artificial intelligence uh, is a moving target uh, since the beginning of the field in the Dartmouth conference in the late 50s, uh, where uh, two of the founding members of the MIT Media Lab and the MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab and CSAIL were, namely Marvin Minsky and uh, Seymour Papert. Uh, the goal is to essentially study intelligence, which also is not very well defined and uh, to replicate essentially human intelligence. Uh, what we call in uh, our uh, profession, artificial general intelligence. Uh, this goal has always been 20 years away since the beginning of the field. And uh, even today with all the progress, it's still 20 years away. If you ask uh, the practitioners, the top practitioners of the field, when are we going to have intelligence equivalent to human? They're gonna tell you in about 20 years. I mean, the general consensus is still 20 years away. Uh, why is that? Because we don't exactly know how to define intelligence, human intelligence. It's a very big thing. Uh, the human brain is probably the most complex machine in the universe. Uh, billions and billions of neurons. Uh, we know more. We learn more about the human brain an accelerating pace. And uh, the more we know, uh, the more we realize that we don't know. Nevertheless, in the recent years, we had an explosion of uh, what we call artificial intelligence, and mainly in the form of one of the techniques of artificial intelligence, uh, namely machine learning and uh, even more, uh, one of the sub-techniques of machine learning, which is deep learning. This was 
more of an accident and less of an intentional uh, progress. Uh, computers became fast enough to run algorithms that were not practical until a, very, a few years ago. Uh, and more importantly, we have a lot of data available to us. And artificial intelligence today, uh, if we want our audience uh, to get one thing out of the definition is how we teach machines to do things for us, not by giving them explicit instructions as we have been doing since the 40s, but by giving them uh, examples of things and letting them learning by those examples. So uh, these examples can be curated by us in the form of labor data and where we have supervised learning, where we have data that we have already categorized. So we have images and we know that we have, you know, images of cats or dogs or whatever. ImageNet is a big database of images where we used to train algorithms. And we feed all these things on the machine and instead of telling them how to recognize uh, something, we give them examples of that thing. And we also can do it by giving criteria to the machine and uh, letting the machine you know, see if it can meet those criteria. And that's how we usually train machines to play games. We give them the rules of the games. We tell them, play games with yourself. And you know when you are going to win and you are going to lose. And that's how you learn how to do these things. And that's the example of reinforcement learning, uh, as it is called in our section. And this is a sector. And this is how uh, one of the most uh, fundamental uh, examples and uh, most uh, impressive examples, which was uh, a few years ago, the dominance of machines over uh, uh, Go players uh, with uh, uh, Google's DeepMind's AlphaGo uh, system. So machine artificial intelligence these days is about data. Uh, artificial intelligence is about looking for patterns into data that are impossible to analyze uh, in the normal way by humans. And in that form, uh, it has a few characteristics. It doesn't understand about high le higher level mental notions. It doesn't understand about cause and effect. It just see correlations. It just see relations between data. It just sees, for example, in the one of the best recent known examples of uh, artificial intelligence success, the uh, Microsoft's and OpenAI's uh, GPT-3 natural language processing model. All that it learns from is where words appear in, relations to, in relation to each other in large corpuses of text. It doesn't understand the relations and it doesn't understand meaning. Uh, and that's a good thing and a bad thing. Uh, sometimes there is a lot of things to be learned, to be discovered in data. Uh, and as long as we understand that, uh, artificial intelligence uh, is going to be a very helpful tool and has been proven to be an extremely helpful tool. Uh, at the moment, though, that because it does better than us, we try to assume that it understands about me. It, it starts to grasp the meaning of words and uh, issues. And uh, to be able to come into conclusions by you know, putting together cause and effect, then we are, might start to get into trouble with it. And that's where we have to be very, very careful. Uh, uh, I will stop here. Uh, hopefully, we will uh, uh, have the opportunity to uh, mention some examples of good and bad uses down the road. Uh, but it is definitely one of these uh, 
important moments in human history where we have a new tool, a very new powerful tool, uh, and we have to figure out how to use it effectively. Thank you. Thank you, Mihaly. Uh, you certainly uh, sketched out the uh, framework uh, so that we understand what we are talking about. Constantine, the floor is now yours. Um, if you can use any example to make it uh, more uh, uh, vivid and to illustrate uh, uh, to us uh, what we mean, it would be helpful. Yes. Yeah, so uh, hi, everybody. Good evening. Uh, thanks a lot for hosting me. Uh, so Mihalis gave a good introduction to where things are uh, uh, in AI. And uh, I should say I'm, it is a crossroads and uh, I'm generally optimistic about uh, both, you know, short term and longer term uses of AI. At the same time, um, uh, we shouldn't get too excited. So we shouldn't be, uh, you know, techno optimists because as Mihalis has been saying, um, uh, history has shown that uh, AI alternates be between periods of uh, overpromising and overexcitement and periods of uh, stagnancy. And currently we are going through a period of overexcitement, uh, which of course is going to hit a limit. Uh, and that limit is uh, scientific. So there are just some things we can do and some things we have no idea how to do. And no hardware is going to get us there. Um, so in particular, we should take developments at face value and uh, we should understand uh, what uh, these developments really are. So let, let me give a few examples of what we can do well, what we cannot do well, and also what I think are the uh, challenges that we are facing. So things we can do well, to some extent at least, uh, are speech recognition, to a lesser extent, uh, image recognition and playing some hard games that are well-defined games, games where the rules of the games and the payoffs of, to the players are very clear. Uh, famously, a few years ago, uh, the AlphaGo algorithm was able to beat uh, the champion, I don't know, one of the best players in Go in the world. Okay, Go was considered to be a super hard game for computers to play, uh, but uh, that milestone was reached earlier than we thought. So that that's great. That that is a, that is a true success. Um, right. So together with image and speech recognition. Uh, on the other hand, uh, understanding. Okay, so so if you want, image and speech recognition is more about pattern matching. Uh, at a deeper level, uh, you want to understand the meaning. And when it comes to meaning, we haven't made much progress. So in particular, uh, text understanding, so answering questions about a text you read, uh, uh, doing dialogue with another you know, person, uh, translating text. Uh, generating text in, in, a, in, a, in a way that sort of like uh, as you span uh, pages and pages of text, it actually maintains some coherence. These are things we cannot do very well. And then there are things we cannot do well at all. And, and these are what human brains are remarkably good at doing, which is to transfer learning, which is to transfer intuition and uh, cognitive abilities from some interesting uh, cognitive tasks that they have acquired to some other somewhat related uh, cognitive task that is not identical. Uh, and uh, humans can do that without, uh, uh, you know, without consuming a lot of examples from their environment. So they can easily adapt, uh, you, know, you know, if you know how to walk, you don't need too much trial and error to know how to bike. Uh, and you don't want, need too much trial and error to know how to ski, right? So a, a robot, uh, you know, if you, if you teach a robot to lift glasses from uh, a table, and then you want to teach it to lift uh, plates from a table, you have to retrain it. You have to, you have to throw at it a lot of examples to learn how to adapt from lifting uh, you know, glasses to lifting plates. Right, so you know, so, so so humans are remarkably good at 
not needing a lot of practice to transfer uh, uh, between related cognitive abilities. So, so this is where uh, you know science is just not deep enough uh, to be able to uh, 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 to address. Now, on the more technical side, and you know, I, I did say that you know, like we have learned speech, and you know, we, we have acquired the ability. Like computers are good at speech and image recognition. Nevertheless, they're not as good as you think. So they are good uh, under lab conditions. Uh, at least, image recognition is mostly only good under lab conditions. If you take an image uh, recognition algorithms outside of uh, you know, certain benchmarks that have been used to train it, then uh, the accuracy drops by a lot. Um, so uh, generally speaking, uh, AI algorithms are not robust to changing the conditions uh, within which they were trained. So that's a big issue. Um, they're generally data hungry. And the more complex the cognitive ability you want to learn, the more data you need. And, you know, despite, uh, you know, all this talk about big data and, you know, like, uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, compared to the types of uh, models we, we, we want to train, uh, we, we don't have, uh, you, know, as, you know, as much data as you would think. Okay, so uh, we don't, you know, we don't have a lot of, you know, videos of people, you know, uh, doing various things to train our robots to do similar things. So we, or we don't have, we have not spent many cycles interacting with our robots, let's say, teaching them how to do different things for, for, for them to be able to acquire those types of abilities. Then our algorithms are very um, sensitive to biases. As you know, data we acquire from society uh, is biased in many ways. Society itself is biased, right? So there are many, you know, stereotypes and you know, uh, 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 many sort of like systematic, uh, 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 sort of like uh, biases that uh, exist in the data we collect, and these actually trickle down into the algorithms that we train. So that's a big issue as well. Um, back to not understanding meaning, uh, and more like more doing pattern recognition. Our algorithms do not understand the causal relationships between phenomena that they are observing. They mostly pattern match that you know when something happens, uh, something follows, but, but they cannot distinguish the causal relationship between is it rain that causes you know uh, you know uh, you know people to be out with umbrellas, or is it people with umbrellas outside that causes uh, you know the sky to rain? So. Current algorithms do not understand the causal relationship between uh, uh, phenomena they observe. Uh, they're not uh, good at, co at, at coexisting with each other. So, so learning algorithms can learn in isolation, but uh, when you put two of them together or more of them together, they have a hard time competing or cooperating uh, in an environment. Uh, and finally, I mean, you know, so there are a lot of uh, issues around for what applications you, you know, you, you, you know, you want to use algorithms, uh, given their accuracy and given the potential biases that they have and so on and so forth. So is it, uh, is it, uh, is it, uh, should we use algorithms, for example, in the judicial system? If those algorithms are trained on data that are provided by a society that has certain uh, you know stereotypes and biases. That's not very clear. We have to be, we have to have a very good understanding about what biases are incorporated in our algorithms if we want to use our algorithms to make uh, uh, you know uh, 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 decisions that uh, 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 should be fair. Okay. And and, and lastly, last remark, uh, and and that's back to what I was saying earlier about not being a techno optimists. Technology is not going to solve everything by itself. Uh, we're not going to reach a point where sort of like we're going to create the you know mega algorithm and the mega uh, sort of like uh, um, learning system 
throw out a lot of data and, and you know, let, let it figure it out all by itself. We need uh, interaction with domain experts to achieve all the promise that we, you know, we are, we are, we are, we are, we are looking for in this space. So, uh, we, you, know, uh, you know, currently a lot of progress has, uh, has been made uh, without so much input for domain experts, but I think for the exciting applications are gonna come when um, uh, AI, the AI field starts uh, uh, a, a deeper integration with other uh, areas. Thank you, thank you, Constantine. Um, I guess you have both answered a question I had in mind about uh, techno optimism. My good uh, assistant and uh, associate, George, sent me a <clears throat> video of a famous debate uh, between the heads of uh, Tesla and uh, Alibaba, in which uh, Elon Musk claims that the machines will become smarter than uh, people and the Chinese Alibaba owner uh, claims that uh, this won't happen. I guess you both are quite uh, realistic, techno-realist rather than techno-optimistic, techno-optimist in your assessment of the uh, ultimate potential of uh, AI. Or so I think, Michali, no? Uh, look, I'm an optimist. I'm not a techno-optimist. Uh, I believe that technology is one of the great uh, uh, you know, tools. It's one of the great characteristics of humanity. Uh, we use tools and we develop more and more and more powerful tools. I mean, this is what makes us human. One of the main things that makes us human. But uh, it's not the tools that give you your values. Values set your goals and you use your tools to achieve your goals. So you, uh, it's a much more complex uh, ecosystem and definitely I don't believe that, you know, uh, just by making better tools, you are guaranteeing a better outcome. On uh, the other hand, uh, I do believe that machines have become smarter than humans in very narrow tasks. And I will give you a very simple example. This is a real example. This is something that uh, a paper published from the Auto ID Lab at MIT recently, and has to do with detection of COVID. One of the main problems that we had with this pandemic is that testing is still not widely available. We saw that especially in Greece. Well, uh, some guys from the Auto ID Lab and girls, sorry, uh, some researchers from the Auto ID Lab uh, who were working on an algorithm to detect uh, Alzheimer's, early on Alzheimer's, by using vocal cord audio samples, cough, forced cough samples. So they collected, they told people, okay, do some coughing on the microphone. And because neurodegenerative uh, diseases affect the vocal cords, they found a way that they could actually uh, uh, sense early onset of Alzheimer's by using those forced coughs, using machine learning algorithms. Well, it turns out that this works extremely well for COVID because COVID has some neurological effects it does affect your vocal cords. And they were able to collect uh, over 70,000 cough samples from volunteers uh, that contributed to those samples uh, over the internet by using their webcams like we are doing right now or their cell phones. And they were able to train, retrain their model as we say in, this, uh, in the context of AI, Usually in the, I'm going to open a parenthesis here, in the older era of computing where I grew up, uh, you, we used to call about algorithms because algorithms is a sequence of explicit instructions. Now we are talking more about models because yes, these are algorithms, but we are, they are very generic algorithms, which we train. We feed them with data. And if we feed them with enough data, and in this case, they fed them with data and they said, okay, this cough comes from a sick person. 
this cough comes from a healthy person. You train enough uh, uh, the model, and they were able to uh, detect COVID uh, with 100% accuracy afterwards. Let me ask you uh, something before I turn to Costantinos. Uh, um, and um, uh, what you said in the very beginning kind of uh, 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 is in my mind, sticks with me. Uh, is maybe the term intelligence the problem? I mean, uh, you refer to the human brain and kind of you made a parallel between artificial intelligence with human intelligence. Is this the right paradigm or is it more confusing and creates all sorts of other problems to use the term artificial intelligence, in the, the, the word intelligence to describe uh, what AI is doing? And I wonder if this is a debate in your field or is it something that has been answered? Well, no, it hasn't been answered. And it's a great question because Artificial intelligence as a field is moving ahead by setting benchmarks. However, every time one of these benchmarks is achieved, one of these goals is achieved, we stop thinking about that task as intelligent. So the famous, famous first debate at MIT was between a philosopher and the early guys at uh, CSAIL, where Constantinos works, uh, as to where, whether a computer will be ever able to beat a human in chess. We are talking about the early 60s for that. That was the original benchmark. <laughs> and we know what happened. We don't consider chess playing such an intelligent, a sign of artificial intelligence anymore because most machines with a chess program can beat most humans these days. That doesn't mean that the machines are intelligent anymore. So uh, before that, it was whether a computer could do algebra. <laughs> as soon as we did that, so we, are, we keep moving as humans the goalpost further and further out. So it is definitely an intelligent task, but it's a narrow intelligent task. And I think that's the way I would answer it. Constantinos might have a slightly different definition there, but it is narrow. And the important thing is what Constantino said before. It's the transfer of knowledge and intelligence and applying what we learn doing one thing into a completely different context. And that's what we have been extremely good at. And that's what machines cannot do. And how we do it eludes us still. I understand. Now, Constantine, give us some practical examples. What the hell is this AI in our daily life? I mean, how would it facilitate it, make it better, uh, more productive, happier? I don't know. I mean, why should the average man, the average Joe, uh, in the street care about uh, uh, all this talking about the new age. Right. So, I mean, so there are many applications already of AI and, you know, very recent AI technologies that are already deployed, but not as many as you would think. So the primary, like the, the let's say the most robust uh, recent development that is already deployed is uh, speech recognition. The, your ability to talk to your Google and do search by voice or, or, or Siri or other similar technologies, you know, Alexa and so on and so forth, you know, these are technologies that are already out there and they're working very robustly. So, you know, so back in the day, even like 20 years ago, if you, if you would call a phone center, a phone call, like a, like a, like a phone center with, with an accent, you wouldn't be able to navigate the phone center. Like, you know, your, your, your accent would just be rejected. Uh, so now you talk to your Alexa with, you know, whatever accent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, and, you, know you, 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 you can, you know, perfectly direct it to do whatever you want. So, so, so that is an example of a technology that is robust and hence already deployed. Uh, 
to a lesser extent, uh, image recognition is deployed. I mean, you know, image recognition is used a lot by, um, uh, uh, you know, for, for policing, I guess, like, uh, 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 um, uh, it's also yeah. So so mostly, uh, I guess you know you you know as as you know you can also uh, search things in Google by uploading an image rather than typing a term or or talking to Google. You can upload an image and also do search via image to get related images. Um, but uh, yeah, so these are two two uh, two example applications, right? Now. Uh, you know, chess and, you know, some, you know, game playing is also obviously uh, already deployed. And then uh, sort of like a lot of sort of like what happens in behind the scenes in, in, in lots of uh, the technologies that you are using, uh, be it, you know, what advertisements you see when you go online, uh, you know, like how news are prioritized in your news feed. Uh, what messages various bots in Twitter sent you. Uh, you know, lots of these are enabled to some extent by AI. Mm. Okay. Uh, Dimitri, yes. one, uh, uh, I, I will disagree a little bit uh, as to how much image recognition is deployed. Image recognition in uh, specific contexts is very widely deployed. So for example, in my supermarket, when I go to the self-checkout lane and I put, you know, a few pieces of fruit into the scale, the uh, automatic scale already has suggestions for me as to what kinds of fruit these things are, to give you a simple idea. The cars that you drive, are already recognizing uh, speed limit signs. Uh, this is not, I, I drove a car like that in Greece. I rented a car like this uh, in Greece three years ago. Uh, it was a simple, you know, very inexpensive car, not very expensive. So, uh, but it's in narrow context, I think, but it's very widely deployed. However, the most wide application of AI right now is the recommendation engines that you see on the big internet platforms. Oh, on the what? On the... on the big internet platforms, on Facebook, on Google. And they, uh, they are the applications that are trying to maximize your engagement with them. Right. Trying to predict what you would want to see or do afterwards, so this, that they can keep you there. And this brings me to my next question. Is this all an American invention or an American dominated interest? I, I mean, I'm, as a, pol a political scientist, and obviously as a politician, I'm very interested in the geo strategy of this fourth uh, industrial revolution and AI. And it seems to me that uh, especially this internet is dominated by those American tech uh, giants like uh, Google and uh, Facebook. And there is all this talking about how to constrain them and control them. I wonder if you look on the globe from a distance, where is this AI happening the most? What are the uh, leadership centers and where does Europe stand? Um. So I think, so there is a very clear competition for talent. You know how these things work, right? Like, you know, the more money a company has, the more competitive they are in hiring talent. And uh, uh, the more, you know, the more talent they have, they, they make their platforms better. And, you know, by making their platforms better, they have a lot of user engagement and a lot of data. And by having more data, they can make their platforms even better and get even more money and hire even better talent and so on and so forth, right? Now, that is one component. And certainly US has, uh, uh, you know, innovated, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and driven a lot of the developments in the field. Uh, at the same time, uh, yeah, a lot of other countries have realized that this is sort of like a, a survival strategy that, uh, uh, you know, being competitive in this field uh, is important for survival of their economies. Uh, yeah, and, and, and some countries are actually 
you know, a little bit uh, more stringent with the use of, you know, human, like, you know, like, like data, uh, like, like private data and, or, 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 or less stringent with the use of private data. So let's say like maybe Europe is in the, on the more stringent side, while say China is on the uh, less stringent side. So, um, um, you know, uh, so, so, so again, you know, a lot of the developments are in US, but uh, uh, China, Canada, and, you know, Europe are also, uh, you know, contributing. I'll, I'll I will come back to you, Constantine, on, Constantine, in regards to your uh, word talent and how can our societies better look for, exploit and reward talent. Um, and obviously this is a question for our own country, Greece. But uh, before that, Michali, you wanted to say something. Yes, uh, I think that uh, we are looking at a very bipolar world right now. Uh, definitely the US is in the forefront right now. Uh, definitely it is large corporations that are driving progress in that area. And uh, that has a lot of implications and we should revisit that. Uh, as Costantino said, China is also because of the size and because of the different, totally different philosophical approach that they have towards privacy. Uh, they have a lot more data and um, they have a much more surveillance oriented application framework they are in mind. Uh, they are doing very well uh, in uh, all the standard applications of AI that has to do with, for example, language manipulation, translation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and Europe is falling behind. I don't think that Europe is contributing, uh, is pulling its weight at this point in time, mostly because a, it's fragmented, but most importantly, it doesn't have the big companies that are driving this. Uh, doing, uh, being at the cutting edge of uh, AI research at this point in time requires tremendous infrastructure that only the large internet companies have. Not even governments have this kind of, the US government doesn't have that kind of data center capacity that the private sector has right now. Uh, nevertheless, as the example that I mentioned before, I think that we can still, uh, uh, universities and top universities can still compete uh, by sheer human brain power, but, and uh, uh, to a large extent, because a, a lot of this talent that works for these AI, these big internet platforms, are doing things that are not so beneficial to society. Showing me, showing me or deciding which advertisement should I see next is not the most efficient use of all of these resources on a society level. It is very profitable for these corporations. Though. <laughs> I understand. Now, uh, you mentioned before that AI is just a part of a wider uh, network of uh, uh, fourth industrial revolution. And I wonder, Michali, if you could just sketch out the other components so that we have a total view of what is happening technologically on the cutting edge. Well, uh, it's all internet and computing based uh, for the most part. And to that, I will also include uh, genetics. Uh, because that's also the study of code <laughs> uh, and where the progress that we see would have not been able without uh, computing. Uh, but you can add to that additive manufacturing, what we mostly call 3D printing. You can add robotics to that. Uh, you can add... Uh, uh, big uh, data science and data analytics that we can do at uh, scales that we were not able to do before. Uh, hmm. 
It's all, it's all, it's all computing based, though. Computing and communications based. You know, 5G. You know, uh, artif- people are adding to that augmented intelligence, uh, augmented reality. I'm sorry, virtual reality. All of these applications that have to do with the manipulation of information around us. Now, Constantine, I want to turn to you and ask you uh, if you have thought about risks and dangers involved in these uh, developments and what uh, are they, if any, and what should we do to counter them? And uh, what, where is the world moving into this utopia or dystopia of uh, new technology? Yes, I'm going to start with an example that Michael mentioned earlier of that of self-driving cars and the deployment of image recognition. Actually, image recognition is very bad. So it's very prone to error. And for example, you know, like famously, you know, like you can very easily perturb uh, an image you feed to a computer to confuse it, thinking that the speed limit is a stop sign or, you know, speed limit, you know, like 50 kilometers an hour is 100 kilometers an hour. So like you can put like, you know, you can take the a speed limit and put uh, stickers at the right places, like stick, you know, white stickers at the right places and uh, fool the algorithm to think uh, whatever else you want it to think. So the uh, same is true with, you know, like uses of image recognition in policing that was mentioned earlier. Um, uh, you know, uh, it's easy to sort of like, uh, you know, uh, you know, put, put the right makeup to uh, think, uh, to make the neural network believe that, you know, you are, I don't know, uh, Claudia Schiffer or whatever, right? You, you choose, you choose to, you, you want it to believe. Uh, so, uh, you know, a student of mine at MIT, uh, 3D printed a turtle uh, out of plastic and painted the shell of the turtle uh, in, uh, in a way that to a human eye still appears like a reasonable shell for a t- turtle. But uh, if you show it to image recognition algorithms, uh, it uh, classifies it as a rifle. And rifle is an arbitrary choice. They could, they could make the algorithm think you know, that this little turtle is whatever they wanted it to think, okay, gold. Uh, so uh, image recognition, as well as speech recognition, but they're very prone to uh, orchestrated attacks. So when we are to deploy the technology in the real world, we should be very careful about what it really can and cannot do. So we shouldn't be thinking that, you know, like we have a robust piece of technology that we're going to put in self-driving cars and, you know, you know, slip in the back seat and let it drive us, uh, you know, in the city, okay? Uh, you know, um, so we, ha- we have to be super careful about, you know, how exactly we use it and within what context we use it, okay? So if we're gonna use image recognition in our car, maybe we should have other systems that, uh, you know, will, will counteract uh, strange decisions that uh, uh, the image recognition software may make. So that's uh, point number one. So that's one big danger, okay? So deploying the technology, thinking it can do something when it's not you know, robust, uh, you know, opens a, you know, a huge uh, safety uh, issue. The other, the other um, issue is uh, something I mentioned earlier, we have to do with uh, bias in the data. Uh, uh, and again, you know, maybe law enforcement is another good example. So, uh, you know, as has been mentioned several times in this discussion, so uh, algorithms learn from data. Uh, so now the question is, who is going to curate the right data set? And where are they going to get it from? Uh, a standard place to get data is uh, the world, like, the, uh, you know. And, um, uh, the, but however, the world has certain uh, systematic uh, omission of data or systematic amplification of data. So you can, you can very well imagine that, you know, sort of like a subpopulation 
uh, who has a um, smaller voice expressing their opinion within a bigger society is going to be underrepresented in the data that you collect from that society. Or to give another example, if a certain subpopulation has not been getting uh, bank loans to open their businesses because of whatever stereotypes exist in the society, um, uh, then you won't have enough data to know whether or not uh, they can reliably receive loans. So now if you train your algorithms using data that is already biased, your algorithm is going to incorporate uh, the biases that it sees in the data, thinking that these are really representative of the underlying phenomenon. Uh, combined with what I was saying earlier, that these algorithms are not able to understand causal relationships between various variables that are being observed, it may misunderstand a correlation that is explained by some bias that exists in society with causation. It may think that a certain subpopulation is not receiving loans because they're unreliable, rather than a certain subpopulation does not receive loans because we are all uh, biased against that subpopulation. I understand. So, so we have to be very careful about exactly what the algorithm has learned if we're going to use it. And last point is, as I was saying earlier, like interaction of learning algorithms with each other. That you know, uh, you know, but you know, uh, you know, hell can break loose if you have various algorithms that are interacting and learning and making decisions in the same environment. The, the technology is just not there to. Um, um, uh, sort of like, you know, to, 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 to suggest what learning algorithms that should be using to learn in such an environment. Thank you. Michali, I want to insist further on this point of risks and danger, and maybe you help us navigate a little bit the politics side of it, not only the technological clip uh, failures of, uh, of all this, but when technology does not fail, when technology works as intended, but in the hands of uh, uh, malevolent politicians and states, authoritarian prone states, um, uh, how can this be, uh, uh, um, uh, can this put uh, uh, our freedom and uh, our privacy uh, at risk and what needs to be uh, done? Is this a debate that you have in the Media Lab? Yeah, well, that's a global debate, I think. That's a debate that everybody has at this point. Uh, however, I uh, have to uh, go back that to, I have to take a step back. Uh, as we heard up to now, uh, these algorithms, these models, these AI models are very good when they are applied at a very narrow context. That means that uh, they are be, can be easily tricked off. Uh, actually, I was using a Constantinos example. I didn't know that it was your student, Constantinos, but I have been using that example with a turtle and the rifle. Uh, since my first talk in AI years ago. Uh, so, uh, but it's very easy to throw these algorithms off. So there is always, there, are all, there, there is the need for a human to be in the loop all the time. These algorithms can only be used as aids. Not, it's, you should never leave, you know, very important complex decisions including who to kill, which is a debate that is happening right now with drones and autonomous weapon systems, et cetera, et cetera, to the, uh, just to the algorithm, because they are not quite there yet, period. Uh, so assuming that we are talking about a human in the loop, uh, one of the great dangers that I see, besides the authoritarian use, and I have to be careful there because, especially with the Chinese, it's a completely different world. Let's focus on the Western world right now, where you know authoritarianism is coming back. It's getting multiple forms. It's creeping back uh, uh, lately. 
uh, I'm much more concerned about uh, the uh, large corporations right now that have uh, ex that are using these algorithms extensively in a very automated way and without having any regulatory framework in place, especially in the US. So in the US, technology was self-regulated or this specific technology was mostly self-regulated at this point. In Europe, we started with regulations before we even developed the technology too much. Uh, it's global, uh, but uh, I'm much more concerned about, for example, what Facebook does with all the behavioral data that it collects about each and every one of us and to which they are accountable to none, especially with their stock structure, with a special stock structure, they, you know, it's all in the hands of Mark Zuckerberg, who has behavioral, very detailed behavioral profiles about each and every one of us, we are through advertising, you know, our, uh, which Facebook doesn't do, other people do very effectively on uh, Facebook. They can actually modify behavior. If you know all the buttons <laughs> of each person, then you can push the right buttons at the right time. I mean, this is not something new. I mean, that's the purpose of advertising uh, to modify your behavior towards a specific goal. But now it can be done at a very precise uh, uh, manner through artificial intelligence, through machine learning uh, algorithms uh, that are not accountable to anybody. And there are no humans in there. So one of the things that Facebook did uh, after all the uh, negative publicity that it got uh, since 2016 is that they did hire a lot more people to oversee those algorithms. Yeah. So this is my, this is the point that I want to make at the end of the day. This is not about uh, autonomous artificial intelligence. This has to be about augmenting human intelligence. And if we want to do it like that, it means that humans have to remain into the decision loops that these things are taking. Whether these are uh, decisions about financial risk it's a good thing to have another tool to estimate financial risk, but it shouldn't be the only one. Uh, it is a very good thing that computers can uh, detect skin cancer uh, at a higher accuracy than dermatologists. That doesn't mean anything. That doesn't mean that we don't need dermatologists. It's a very good thing that computers can write standard legal documents better than attorneys, but I mean, if I hear one more person saying that we don't need attorneys <laughs> anymore because of that, my head is going to explode. So that's the important thing. And unfortunately, there are certain incentives, financial incentives in society that push us towards that. And that's the big danger also. And that's what, where we need to focus attention. I'm receiving questions from uh, our audience. Constantinos is back, thank you. Uh, let me now, as we move to our uh, closing, uh, to turn a little bit to two issues. One is Greece and where does our country, our beloved country stand uh, in these uh, developments? And the second is COVID, which is the general, um, the general topic of our uh, Let me start with the latter. How do you think COVID has affected these transitions, these technological developments, uh, Costandine? Uh, sorry, give me just a sec, because I'm connected with two cameras. Hang on a sec. Yes, we, ha you, we have you double. Uh, yeah. okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, so, you know, so, so, so COVID has accelerated uh, you know, not just for Greece, but you know, uh, you know, across the globe, uh, our, our transition to, um, uh, to 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 online. Um, so, 
uh, are you asking me uh, regarding uh, AI specifically or more broadly? More broadly. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, and I think that transition is here to stay. So uh, not uh, to the extreme uh, extent that, uh, you know, that the transition has happened uh, till now, but uh, I think uh, uh, a lot of uh, work is going to happen uh, remotely. Um, because uh, the recent experience has, has proven that, you know, some of this work can indeed happen successfully remotely. So um, um, at the same time, and, and speaking for myself, uh, you cannot replicate, uh, uh, for example, academic research uh, remotely. It's certainly good that uh, I can, uh, uh, you know, uh, keep my connection to my students, but uh, the types of impromptu uh, discussions that you have that are unplanned and which lead to interesting ideas or the random uh, event that, you know, you, a random talk that you attend and uh, which gives you ideas for your own research uh, are not things that you can easily replicate uh, online. So what I, what I see happening is that uh, a, lot, a lot of the work is gonna remain uh, remote. Uh, maybe uh, even uh, you know rents and you know real estate in New York and Silicon Valley is gonna drop because of that because a lot of tech companies are gonna uh, be part part, part uh, remote. Uh, nevertheless, uh, you know this experience has taught us that we really appreciate uh, uh, human interaction and there are certain things that we miss and cannot be replicated online. And uh, uh, you know, we, we, you know, maybe we, we're going to come out of this uh, wiser. Another point I would like to make regarding science and COVID is that uh, this was a COVID was an example where, first of all, science uh, was very reactive and uh, you know gave us vaccines uh, that are hopefully uh, you know. Uh, successful uh, to fighting the disease in, in uh, very fast. Uh, at the same time, um, we saw a lot of different. We, we saw sort of like uh, also certain divisions within science itself about how serious the, the disease is. Everybody doing their own statistical analysis, claiming different things, and um, uh, ultimately uh, an overwhelming amount of uh, opinions that are creating a lot of noise uh, on, on the internet. And I think we should be, we should, you know, we should be doing better. Okay, so uh, uh, we, we should be doing better. So um, it's, it's fascinating what you are saying, because on the one hand, we have the reaffirmation of science and the importance of science and the triumph of science with the early discovery of this vaccine. And at the same time, we have this amazing confusion brought about through a technological advance, which is the internet and uh, uh, the new media and everything that is going around us. So we have both worlds uh, at the same time as a result of the technological uh, advancement, uh, confusion, and, uh, um, um, and the achievement. Um, now it's time for me to make a personal confession or may maybe to make someone else personal confession. While my Michalis is talking to us from Boston where I just saw and I heard about these two feet uh, of snow uh, there in uh, Wesley, uh, Konstantinos is talking to us from Athens, from uh, Greece, and maybe that's why his connection is not that uh, great. It tells a lot about the work we have to do with the 5Gs. Uh, and in that sense, uh, he presents, I mean, your personal stories are both uh, uh, parts of, uh, um, how should I put it, the failures of, uh, the failures of Greece and the opportunity of Greece. On the one hand, you are uh, two bright Greeks uh, uh, who left Greece and had your career abroad. And on the other hand, through this uh, 
disengagement, decoupling of work from residents because of COVID, maybe more permanently in the future, bright people like Constantinos will continue working for MIT, but can reside uh, uh, in Greece uh, and uh, enjoy the benefits of uh, uh, Greek life away from the snow and the problems that uh, Boston life uh, uh, has. So it's an interesting uh, uh, juxtaposition. Uh, tell me, Michalis, what should Greece do uh, in that regard, not to miss the train of the fourth industrial revolution, or is it a train that has already departed? No, uh, there are multiple trains. Uh, the first thing that it should do is uh, really work on its educational system. The educational system of Greece is failing a lot of people. No, yes, we shouldn't look at people like Constantinos. Okay, you know, he's a product, he's a full product. He has a brother also who's a professor at Harvard. So, you know, case solved. If, you know, two brothers from a public school attending a public university can make it at the top of the top, then we are okay, which is what I hear all the time. And I'm getting annoyed. We are a small country. We can afford to fail people. We shouldn't be looking only at the Konstantinos Daskalakis, who is where he is, because partly because of the Greek educational system. Uh, but what happens to the rest of the people that are getting failed by the Greek educational system? And our system suffers uh, in the context of artificial intelligence, since you put it this way, we started this way, uh, from one of the great pathogenies or the biggest pathogeny right now is that we are asking from people that are, in, that are 15 and 16 year old to decide what they are going to do in life. And we are splitting them. We are separating the humanities from the sciences very early on, creating people, producing people out of this educational system that might have been great for the second industrial revolution, where you didn't have to answer complex questions, ethical questions like those all the time that the technology is posing. And we are separating them and we are telling them at 17, you have to declare what you, you have to have decided what you are going to do in your life. Uh, when Unlike myself, who is much older than Constantinos, and maybe Constantinos, who have the luxury of doing pretty much the same thing, most of these people will have to, you know, change things that they are doing. They have to reskill. They have to learn how to learn at school, which is not what we are doing. We are staffing people with knowledge with, uh, that, you know, you can find out. Not how to acquire the knowledge, but just stuff it in there in a static set. So we really have to change uh, our educational system. If one thing uh, uh, artificial intelligence showed us, the progress of artificial intelligence right now is that, you know, humans are still very important. Human intelligence is very important. We have to cultivate that uh, much more importantly. That's a long-term goal. Uh, this is where we are suffering big time. I'm going to go to uh, a more short-term goal. I'm, I'm privileged to have seen uh, the plan of the uh, Ministry of uh, Digital Governance about the, our national plan for AI, which is a very detailed plan, very uh, holistic. And it puts a very ambitious goal since we are not going to be producing very large infrastructures here, uh, we are in a peculiar place speaking a language that not too many people are speaking. Uh, we have some traditions, we have some heritage, and our heritage is, has to do with democracy, has to do with philosophy, has to do with ethics. And they are concentrating heavily on how to make AI trustworthy, ethical, dependable, and I find that as a particularly ambitious goal, and we have to be ambitious. Greece 
always moved forward when people put very ambitious goals in them. And I find it very ambitious because unlike what happens in other countries, Chris doesn't have to be that careful about AI. And the reason that I'm saying this in the application of AI, especially in uh, government, uh, we have a very long tradition about small uh, group special interests, affective, having a disproportionately large effect on policy. So AI and data-based policy making can help a lot in Greece. And it's very ambitious for a country that we know has lacked in institutional quality to put as its goal to improve AI institutionally. But it's the right goal for the country. And I certainly hope and I do know that we have the people that can achieve that goal if they are only led to do so. Thank you, Michali. Constantine, uh, you being uh, successful, uh, young, uh, <laughs> will have the last word as well. Uh, <laughs> tell us uh, a little bit about your mentioning of, I mean, I cannot notice this word talent, talent. And it seems to me that uh, in Greece, uh, until recently, uh, there was an attack uh, on merit and on talent, especially in the educational system, but not only. And I wonder what can we do to overcome this kind of uh, blocking uh, to move forward as a society, as a whole? Yeah, so um, as I was saying earlier, I, I do believe we are in a crossroads and uh, it's a very, it's an especially interesting one. Um, so as you know, economy is, you know, getting more and more globalized. And uh, uh, if we don't uh, catch the, tr the train of these developments, I think we will be more marginalized. So I, I, I agree with Michalis that we should uh, set uh, uh, ambitious goals and, uh, uh, you know, con consider ourselves as, uh, you know, global players and not uh, sort of like uh, uh, peripheral uh, players. I think uh, we should uh, uh, n not uh, sort of like uh, uh, translate technology from that has been developed elsewhere to our own needs, but create technology to export. That, that should be the target. And I think that uh, we do have, uh, you know, tradition and we do have talent in, uh, uh, in in our youth that can drive that progress with the available resources. As you know, there are, there are a lot of resources uh, available. Uh, I think we have the uh, talent pool uh, to uh, drive that progress, but we also should provide uh, the right training and the right resources for them to do so. I think we should uh, invest uh, heavily in uh, research, uh, not uh, only uh, develop, uh, research and development, but like core research that will cultivate this new um, expertise that you need in order to be able to play a global game and not a uh, sort of like peripheral uh, game. Uh, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't exploit the uh, uh, peculiarities of, of the country, right? Like we, we do have some uh, advantages and we should exploit those advantages, but the target should always, al always be global and not local. Uh, and uh, on, on an optimistic note, I think that uh, uh, what the pandemic has taught us is that we can keep uh, open channels of communication uh, uh, to other places in the world in order to, 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 get, to get that going, to get uh, resources, to get uh, the markets. Um, uh, it's more obvious than ever that uh, uh, you can stay connected even if you are working uh, remotely. 
Thank you, Constantine. And on that note, we have to conclude. We are exactly 75 minutes on air. I would like first and foremost to thank you deeply from my heart uh, about your uh, um, contributions. Uh, I know you are very busy. Uh, you have a lot on your plate. Probably you are sick and tired with uh, webinars, uh, but it was really excellent that we managed to secure you and that you both uh, contributed enormously. I am told that we have a record of uh, audience uh, more than uh, in any previous uh, session, uh, double that uh, average. And that shows um, the great interest of our audience in these issues and also the power of, uh, uh, your, um, of your thinking uh, uh, that resonates to a, much, uh, to a very wide uh, audience. Now, I will um, say farewell uh, with your uh, latest phrase next year, hopefully we'll be meeting in Thessaloniki in October 2021. Uh, next year is the bicentennial of the Greek Revolution. This will be the event of the year under the shadow of that uh, uh, celebration we will uh, convene in Thessaloniki. And let me say that the Greek Revolution par excellence uh, was a celebration of optimism and ambition. What else was the revolution other than a feat of uh, um, ambitious optimism? The future belongs to those who are not afraid of it, those who seize it. And I think we should learn the lesson of the revolution uh, 200 years later. Uh, to be optimistic and ambitious in our, our goals. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody uh, uh, for joining us, the thousands of viewers, our great sponsors, the organizers, this wonderful team of assistants without whom we couldn't be uh, here today, from Babis to George to Lola to Pandelis and uh, Lefteris and so many others. I just mentioned very uh, indicatively the various names. Uh, thank you, thank you. One more uh, symposium, the ninth uh, uh, International Symposium of the Saloniki has come to a glorious end. We couldn't have it better. Thank you and Merry Christmas to all. Uh, happy holidays and a very happy 2021. Thank you, Michali. Thank you, Kostandine. Thanks for having us. Happy holidays. Bye. Stay safe, everybody.